In this video, we'll be looking at the Cold War and the 20th century. At the conclusion of World War II, two superpowers emerged both very different from one another. One was a powerful capitalist nation with a large economy and military, the United States. The other was a powerful communist nation with a large military as well, the Soviet Union. Together, these two nations would battle it out economically, politically, and militarily, although not against each other, to become the supreme superpower of the world, leading to the Cold War. Now, directly after World War II, one of the conditions in ending the war was the creation of the United Nations. So, in 1945, the United Nations is formed to prevent future global wars controlled by the Security Council made up of the five world powers at the end of World War II, the United States, Britain, France, the Soviets, and China. And so far, it's worked. There has been no World War III. Now, in 1947, we see the partition of India. Much like many colonial holdings that the European powers had, after World War II, many of them gain independence, and India is no exception. British India is split into India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Now, a man named Gandhi had a lot to do with that. After the partition of British India, Gandhi led non-aggressive techniques or civil disobedience, helping India gain independence from Britain, becoming a well-known humanitarian and a revolutionary. And in the following year, in 1948, the nation of Israel is created after the nationalistic movement to provide the Jews with a homeland. And the reason for that is, is following World War II and the information that comes out about the Holocaust, many believe that in this nationalistic spirit that the Jews needed a homeland of their own, a place that they could call home. And so it was established in their old biblical homeland of Israel. And so that becomes the nation of Israel. But the problem with Israel is that creating this nation displaced a lot of Arab Muslims that were already in that region, a group known as the Palestinians, causing conflict in that region with nations like the United States who greatly back the creation of Israel, drawing a lot of heat and attacks from those who oppose Israel and oppose Israel's biggest friend in the United States. Now, transitioning from the creation of new nations in the world, we're going to move on to the event that helps define the rest of the 20th century after the World Wars, and that is the Cold War, which lasts from 1945 to 1991, in which a tremendous amount of history takes place under this umbrella that we call the Cold War. And to help keep track of the fact that all this stuff is taking place during the Cold War, I've added a little bar here to the left side to kind of commemorate that this is all part of the Cold War. Now what the Cold War is, is this prolonged military tension and political conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union and their allies. And there's a lot of things going on here. First of all is this tension. There is actually no direct warfare between the United States and the Soviet Union. Only what we call proxy wars, which means that these nations indirectly fight each other. If the United States went to war, the Soviet Union typically backed whoever they were fighting against. Again, indirectly fighting the United States through this other power. And the United States did the same thing. If the Soviet Union went to war with somebody, the United States would back their enemy and essentially aid their enemy in helping fight off the Soviet Union. So they're not directly fighting each other. They're fighting in these proxy wars. And understand that this Cold War is more than just a U.S. versus Soviet Union. It is a West versus East, a Western culture and mentality versus an Eastern culture culture and mentality. Democracy and capitalism in the West versus socialism and communism in the East. And this war, this conflict between these two nations, 
never really heats up. That's why we call it a Cold War. But it's fought over not just power, but influence over Europe and other third world countries in which these countries kind of have to pick a side. Are you on Team U.S. or Team Soviet Union? And you can start to really see this divide between East and West in Europe with something known as the Iron Curtain. This barrier that divided Europe that split Germany in two, preventing Western influence from spreading to Eastern European countries. These Eastern European countries that you see here being heavily controlled by the Soviet Union and being, for the most part, very communist, very socialist, very pro Team Soviet Union. But on the other side, we see Team USA here that is pro democracy, pro capitalism, and they oppose the East. So this is where the divide is. This is where East meets West. And nowhere was that more apparent than in Germany. After World War II, Germany and its capital were divided into a democratic capitalist West and a communist socialist East. This is where the first battleground in this ideological fight between East and West occurs. You can see that the country of Germany is split over this issue of democracy and capitalism versus communist and socialism, East versus West, Team USA versus Team Soviet Union. And what you notice when you look at that is that not only was Germany split, but also the capital, Berlin, the capital of Germany, was split. Even though it's deep within East Germany, it was split down the middle, as you can see from this zoomed-in capital map here, into a West Berlin and an East Berlin. East Berlin controlled East Germany. West Berlin, even though it's in East Germany, controlled West Germany. And the reason that this was done is so that the Soviets would not get a victory here. They couldn't take over the German capital. It was going to be split down the middle to kind of, again, be ground zero in this conflict between the Western democracies and the Soviet capitalist expansion. The West was not going to allow the Soviet Union to have control of Berlin, even if it meant splitting the capital in two and controlling only half of it. That's how adamant these two countries were that they don't look bad in the face of the world. And to help secure the United States position in Western Europe and to keep it, you know, pro Team USA, democratic, capitalist, in 1947, the United States issues the Marshall Plan, in which the United States sent millions of dollars in economic aid to Western Europe to help it rebuild after World War II. And they're not just trying to help rebuild Western Europe. They're also trying to prevent communism from spreading. Because typically it's when an economy is doing bad, like what happened in Russia, that communism seems to become appealing. When the economy is bad, the idea of equal wealth distribution that comes with communism sounds very appealing. So if the United States could prevent these Western democracies from being kind of tempted by communism, they're going to do it. And the best way to do that is to rebuild their economies. And so the United States pumps millions of dollars into Western Europe to help them rebuild, including West Germany, a country they just spent four or five years bombing during World War II. They're now turning around and helping them rebuild. And so what this does is kind of create propaganda the East Germans see benefits of life in the West. It doesn't take too long before those that are in West Germany start to prosper under capitalism and the help from the United States and the Western democracies. While the East isn't doing so well, and they can just look across the border and see how good the West has it. And so you start to see a massive migration of people from East Berlin and East Germany into the West. So by 1948, the Russians have to do something to stop this mass migration. And so they decide to block Berlin. Russia blocks all resources from entering West Berlin. 
to essentially starve West Berliners into submitting to the East. This would have been a major victory for the Soviets had it happened. Had West Berlin given in and surrendered to the Soviets, this is good propaganda for the Soviets. This is a victory. They won Berlin. But the West is not going to allow that to happen. And so the United States, Britain, and France engage in what is known as the Berlin Airlift, in which the Allies airlift supplies into Berlin for 11 months before the Soviets eventually back down, lifting the blockade. So this becomes a victory for the West. And since the Berlin airlift happened, 20% of East Germany's population had fled into West Berlin to escape communism. After a demand by the Soviet leaders to close access to West Berlin is denied by President Kennedy in the 1960s, the Soviets will eventually construct the Berlin Wall. But in response to this Soviet aggression that we see here, where the Soviets try to cut off access to West Berlin, the organization known as NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is formed. It's a Western military alliance made up of the United States and other Western democracies in Europe. You can see a map of it here. Eventually, the Soviets will form their own military alliance known as the Warsaw Pact. And so, again, in this map, you can easily see this West versus East mentality that now was developed into the United States and its allies, known as NATO, versus the Soviet Union and their allies, known as the Warsaw Pact. So, definitely an East versus West conflict during the Cold War. But now, after establishing allies, the United States and the Soviet Union began building up their armed forces, especially nuclear weapons, in a new policy of deterrence. The idea of having lots of nuclear weapons would prevent nations from attacking. It's the idea of having, let's say, a BB gun. If one country has a BB gun, the other country would have a BB gun. If one country ended up having 10 BBs, the other country would rise it up to 20. And so the other country would have to rise theirs to 30, and then 40, and 50. And they go back and forth in this arms race to try to outdo one another. Essentially what they're trying to accomplish here is what's known as MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. The idea that if the United States attacks the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union has the same capability of launching attack against the United States and both of them will be destroyed. So they're trying to deter one another by basically saying, we have enough missiles to take you out, you have enough missiles to take us out. And so you start to see that tension building between the United States and the Soviets in this arms race to try to outdo one another. At the same time, the United States turns a blind eye, focusing mostly on Europe, by forgetting that there's still conflict going on in Asia. Case in point, China becomes communist under the leadership of Mao Zedong following the Chinese Civil War. So communism is spreading. Now there had been a civil war going on prior to World War II, but when the Japanese invaded China, the Chinese decided, we have bigger fish to fry, we have a bigger problem, let's deal with it. But after World War II, they go back to fighting, and the communists end up winning, so China falls to communism. The fall of China to communism in 1949 shocked America and led to a buildup of support for Japan, who was seen as a possible ally against communism, much like West Germany in Europe, and especially since the Soviet Union had successfully detonated an atomic bomb that same year. So now both nations have nuclear weapons. But also in Europe we see the Korean War that breaks out in 1950. Here, North Korea, backed by the Soviet Union and China, invades South Korea, backed by the UN and the United States that you see in the map here in the corner. The North invades the South. Only a small pocket of resistance is left. And it's at that point that the UN and the United States intervenes to keep communism out of Korea and eventually push the North Koreans up to the Chinese border. This brings in the Chinese who will aid the North Koreans in pushing back, and what ends up for the next three years is a stalemate. 
That stalemate will end in 1953, establishing the border between North and South Korea at the 38th parallel. There's no peace treaty, so no one won with North Korea still remaining communist and South Korea remaining democratic. But again, with no peace treaty, the war is still technically going on. It just hasn't been fought since 1953. Then in 1957, we see the formation of the European Union, which was formed to unite trade, economics, and laws of many European nations that you see here in blue. So in a sense, it's an alliance between these nations. It's not a military alliance. It's, again, a trade and economic and law alliance between these. So they share a lot of common attributes. One of the most notable things is the fact that most of them use the euro as their currency that you see pictured there. And those living in member nations are allowed to travel, work, and live freely within these nations. So it's kind of as if they're one nation. But back to the tension of the Cold War. In 1961, as I mentioned earlier, the Berlin Wall is finally constructed by the Soviets, dividing East and West Germany to stop that massive migration from the East to the West. Also in that same year, you start to see the development of something that will become known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now in the 1950s, the United States got another shock when Cuba, a country right there on their doorstep, fell to communism. But in the summer of 1962, American spy planes discovered Soviet missile silos being constructed in Cuba, able to reach the United States within minutes. And you can see a map there showing the circles of the different stages of rockets the Soviets were putting in Cuba and where they would reach within minutes. In response, the United States threatens war. The U.S. ordered a naval blockade or a quarantine order to stop any ship entering Cuba and demanded the Soviets dismantle and remove these missiles, that any missile launched against the United States would be met with a nuclear attack against the Soviets. At this point, the world held its breath. But eventually, the Soviets offered a deal. The Soviets would remove their missiles if the United States didn't invade Cuba and would remove their missiles from Turkey, a neighbor of the Soviet Union. So in a way, the Soviet Union was simply doing the same thing the United States had done to them, putting missiles right there on their doorstep. But in the end, America agreed to this deal, and this big crisis was over, as the world came the closest it ever came to nuclear war. And speaking of war, the United States gets involved in another war in the 1960s into the 1970s. This is the Vietnam War that starts in 1964, and it has to do with something known as the domino theory. This theory stated that if one country was allowed to fall to communism, then the surrounding countries around it would also fall to communism. Again, in a domino effect. One falls, the rest of them fall. And so, in Vietnam, to keep Vietnam from falling to communism, the United States sends thousands of troops to Vietnam. In the end, this becomes a very indecisive war, ending in the United States withdrawing from Vietnam in 1973, showing the limitations of the United States' superpower status. And Vietnam will ultimately fall to communism in 1975. So this long war, in many respects, was for nothing. They'd fought to keep Vietnam from falling to communism. They'd fought it for nine long years. And in the end, Vietnam falls to communism two years after the United States pulls out. But at the same time that the Vietnam War is ending, another crisis takes place, the OPEC oil crisis. OPEC standing for the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, petroleum being oil. To protest those who supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War, OPEC announced that it would begin an embargo. Basically, they're going to ban trade to all nations that supported Israel, that being the United States and Western democracies. Well, what this does is cause oil prices worldwide to skyrocket, to increase, essentially an economic crisis. They raise the price of oil by 70% within the United States, so that in 1973, a barrel of gas cost $3.00. 
by 1980, that had jumped up to $30. That's an incredible increase there. These high prices for fuel and less money to spend on goods led many economies into a recession, like the United States suffered in the 1970s. And the reason that this has such a global economic worldwide crisis is because the world was starting to become much more globalized in what we call globalization, this economic, social, and cultural integration of society made possible by the network of communication, television, radio, now the internet has allowed the mass commercialization of goods and information around the world. So what affects one country affects the rest. It's very much like the nations of the world are connected in some kind of spider web. If one nation has an economic problem, the rest of them share in that. But speaking of economic problems, after years of economic turmoil, the Soviet Union began losing its grip on many Eastern European nations. This is evident by the fact that 1989, that Berlin Wall comes down. By 1990, the following year, Germany is united into one country once again. And in 1991, the Soviet Union finally collapses, ending the Cold War that had lasted for nearly 45 years leading to a decade of peace and prosperity during the 1990s, which ends suddenly at the turn of the next century. And it's during the 1990s that other issues in the world start to come to the surface. Things like apartheid, which was this legal separation of Africans from whites in South Africa. Again, going back to the time of imperialism, many Europeans had flooded into these African nations and taken control. Even after these nations gained their independence, the white European population in these countries still maintained a lot of political control, especially in places like South Africa, where there was legal separation of the races that kept the native black population down and elevated the white European population living there. But by 1994, in South Africa, the policy was banned after decades of discrimination. And one of the individuals that's responsible for that is Nelson Mandela, that you see pictured there, who becomes South Africa's first black president and helps end apartheid in that country. And now the last thing that we're going to look at is September 11, 2001. On that date, the United States is attacked by a terrorist group known as Al-Qaeda. It's mastermind by Osama bin Laden that you see pictured there. Using planes, or jetliners really, to strike and destroy the World Trade Centers in New York City and a section of the Pentagon in Virginia. And in this video, you can see the second plane hitting the second tower. At that point, the United States realized it was under attack that the first plane had not been an accident, that this was intentional. The United States would soon learn that the people responsible behind this was a terrorist group known as Al-Qaeda that was based out of Afghanistan. This would lead to a global war on terror led by the United States. And eventually, Osama bin Laden, the mastermind of 9-11, is killed in May of 2012. Because of that event, the world would never be the same and would continue to change in ways we have yet to fully understand. As we look towards the future with anticipation of what's to come on this amazing journey of human civilization that continues to write the story of world history.